So it's a great honor and pleasure to be here today uh, in honor of the inauguration of Peter Salove as the 23rd president of Yale University. Um, those of you who came thinking that with this was a public lecture may not have realized that this is actually a comprehension quiz for those of you who are alumni of the Directed Studies program. Uh, so I'm looking for identifications from the audience of the five figures you see before you, seeing no volunteers. Uh, these are the five figures onto whom I will project the five secrets to ancient and modern flourishing that I want to talk about today. They are Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, uh, his student Plato, Plato's student Aristotle, and then moving a bit forward in history, the Roman philosopher Cicero and Epictetus. And what I want to try to articulate today is why it is that the ideas of these figures and the intellectual tradition of which they are representatives are ideas that would have been studied if you were a student at Plato's Academy in ancient Greece, or if you were a student in ancient Rome, or a student studying at one of the original universities, such as Paris in the Middle Ages, or what you would have studied as a Yale student in the 1890s, or as a student at Yale in the 1940s when students looked like this, or the 1950s when they looked very different, like this, or in the 1960s when they looked very different, like this. And good to know that change finally came up. Uh, Extraordinary. Uh, Yale Prom Committee, 1974. This uh, is so old, it's new again. My barista looks like that. Uh, or this is my own graduating class, a time during which even when we were dancing, we were struggling with the ideas of these authors. Yale students read them in the 1990s and in the 2000s, and they continue to read them in courses that we teach here today. And what I want to try to share with you is a common idea that I think underlies not only the work of these five authors, but in fact, most of the world's wisdom traditions. So though the discussion that I'll be presenting to you today draws almost exclusively on the ancient Greek and Roman tradition on the one hand, and contemporary work in psychology, particularly work done in America and England on the other. The ideas that are given voice to by this tradition are ideas that are present in every wisdom tradition that I know of. They're certainly present in the wisdom traditions of what we call the East, that is in the wisdom traditions of China and Japan and India and Korea. And they're certainly present in the wisdom traditions of the Africa and the Native American traditions. So the fundamental idea that I think lies at the heart of all great wisdom traditions is that what we might metaphorically call the human soul, the human mind, the human spirit, human psychology, exhibits a certain sort of internal complexity. In particular, the soul has both parts that we would call reflective or rational or directly accessible to conscious reflection. And it has parts that we might characterize as non-reflective, as non-rational in a strict sense, as not directly accessible to conscious reflection and linguistic articulation. And flourishing tends to occur when the parts of the soul are appropriately aligned. That is, when the relations between what we might think of as the rational or reflective parts of the soul and between the non-rational and non-reflective parts of the soul are somehow in a harmonious state, in a state that whichever part of the soul is better suited to be dealing with the situation at hand finds itself in the position 
to be controlling what it is that the mouth says, what it is that the hands do. This, however, exactly because the picture is correct, requires that the understanding of this insight be one that is encoded not merely in the rational part of the soul. That is, it's not simply enough to recognize with the reflective part of the soul that the soul has parts and that it's important for them to be in appropriate relations with one another. Exactly because of the fact that so much of what we do and so much of how we respond is the result of the non-rational parts of the soul, the insight needs to be encoded both by the reflective and by the non-reflective parts. Now, the ancient Greek philosophical tradition has language to articulate these ideas. It has a notion of the kind of flourishing that I've been describing, a flourishing that results from the appropriate harmonious relation between the rational and non-rational, or reflective and non-reflective parts of the soul. And that term is eudaimonia, where daimon means spirit. We might translate that as spiritual well-being. And it also has a term for being such that one holds a proper reflective and non-reflective understanding of the relations between these parts. And that term is phronesis, sometimes translated as practical wisdom. So what I want to try to do in the next 45 minutes or so is to give you a sense of five aspects of this worldview. The worldview according to which phronesis, an appropriate understanding of the relation between the parts of the soul, can lead to eudaimonia, a kind of spiritual well-being. So those five aspects can be summed up in fairly short bullet points, though spelling them out in detail is the project of a lifetime. And those five aspects are these. The insight that we'll take from Socrates concerns the importance of developing appropriate self-knowledge, which will turn out to involve a rather ironic or perplexing thing, namely the recognition that self-knowledge is inevitably limited. The second insight we'll draw from Socrates' student Plato the focus on the importance of developing an appropriate harmonious relation among the parts. But the question of how that practically can be carried out is one that will turn to the works of Aristotle to understand, looking at the value and importance of habit in allowing us to cultivate this kind of phronesis. We'll then look very briefly at the role that social interaction can play in making that possible, drawing on some insights from Cicero, who himself is drawing on some insights from Aristotle, who himself is drawing on some insights from Plato, who is actually just channeling Socrates. Uh, so it really is just one guy in our story. Uh, and then we'll close with some insights from Epictetus about delineating the appropriate realms for attempted control. So let's begin with our first character. This is Socrates, the night before his death, about to drink the hemlock, uh, which he has been sentenced to drink by the citizens of Athens for having corrupted the youth. And here he is, surrounded by his students at the moment of his death. And Socrates' student Plato goes on to tell the story of the days leading up to Socrates' death in a famous dialogue called the Apology. And in that dialogue, there occurs the following interchange between a student of Plato's, uh, sorry, a student of Socrates, and the great oracle at Delphi. And the interchange goes as follows. Chirophon asks the oracle, which is supposed to give you the voice of the gods. Chirophon says to the oracle, who is the wisest of all men? And the oracle responds by saying, 
no one is wiser than Socrates. Chirophon brings this report back to Socrates. And in the Apology, Plato goes on to tell us what it is that Socrates says in response. And Socrates responds as follows. When I heard this, that is, when I heard that the oracle said, no one is wiser than me, I said to myself, what can the oracle mean when it says that no one is wiser than I am? For I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. And he continues, giving us some insight into how it was that he managed not to be the most popular man in his city. I went to one who had the reputation of wisdom, and when I began to talk with him, I could not help thinking that he was not really wise, although he was thought wise by many and wiser still by himself. <laughs> Socrates provides a corrective by giving his own opinion to the gentleman. Uh, and then the discussion concludes with Socrates saying this. So I left him saying to myself as I went away, well, although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is, for he knows nothing and thinks that he knows, whereas I neither know nor think that I know. This insight that self-knowledge requires a recognition of the limits of rational reflection in providing access to motivation turns out to be one of the central themes of contemporary work in psychology. So Socrates' idea that one source of wisdom is knowing what one doesn't know, and that this includes our motivations and the source of many of our attitudes, that self-knowledge requires humility, knowing that one does not fully know oneself, can be seen as the origin of a research program in psychology, sometimes known as situationism, which explores the ways in which our responses to our environment are often due not merely to facts about ourselves, but also to features of the environment around us of which we may not be consciously aware. So in a famous study, which is one of the original studies in this research tradition, psychologists looked at the difference between people who were in one of two different situations. Either the person was sitting comfortably on a bench, minding their own business, or the person was walking across a high suspension bridge that was above a large canyon. And what the psychologists did is they had somebody approach the individual and ask them a number of questions, and then offer their phone number as a potential opportunity for following up if the individual had any questions. So in both cases, the researcher came and approached the individual. And what the psychologists were wondering was whether individuals who had been approached while they were sitting on the bench would be more or less likely to phone up the other, the researcher, than individuals who had been standing on the bridge when the approach happened. And here's what the results looked like. When the people had been given the phone number when they were sitting on the bench, only about 30% of them gave a call back. When they were standing on the high bridge when they'd been approached, more than twice as many did. Now, what could explain that difference in results? What are some of the feelings that go through your body when you're standing on a high bridge? Your heart beats fast, your breath is a little light, your pulse feels profound to you. And what are the, some of the things that happen when you are finding yourself attracted to a person who has just approached you? You know, your heart beats fast, your breath is a little short, your pulse is uh, something of which you become highly aware. That is arousal that is due to one feature of a situation, being on a high bridge, turns out to be something that we can misread as having been due to a different feature of the situation, 
namely the presence of an individual towards whom we assume on the basis of our body's report, we feel ourselves to be attracted. And over the decades since this study was conducted, we get repeated research reinforcing this idea, which in some sense is just the idea that you're cranky when your shoes are wet, right? Or that you're happy when the weather looks like this, but reinforcing this idea in a way that brings out that we are often unaware of what it is that's leading to our response. And one of the bodies of research that has been generated as a result of thinking about the way in which our responses may be due to something other than this has been conducted in the laboratory of our own Yale colleague, John Barge. And the studies look like this. You bring somebody into the lab with the thought that what they're going to be asked to do in the context of the laboratory is to evaluate a resume on the basis of certain criteria. How qualified is the person? How likely is the person to be an effective receptionist in an office where that requires a certain degree of friendliness? How capable do you think the person will be of performing activity A or B or C? And the way they run these studies is that right before you come into the lab, you undergo either one kind of experience or another. So you might, in the elevator, have been handed either a warm cup of coffee or a cold cup of coffee. And it turns out that depending on whether you've handled a warm cup of coffee or a cold cup of coffee first, your tendency to evaluate the resume that you've been given as belonging to a person with the warmth necessary to make them an effective receptionist will vary. Or you might be given the resumes to read either on a heavy clipboard or a light clipboard and judge the candidate to have a degree of gravitas that is higher if you've read the resume when holding a heavy clipboard than when holding a light one. And perhaps most disturbingly, this is research done previously to the work done by Barge and Williams, you will typically, if a resume bears the name that is of something unmarked racially, in contrast to a name that is racially marked, have a tendency to evaluate the exact same resume as indicating higher qualifications if the name that appears at its top is an unmarked name like Thomas than if it is a racially marked name like Tyrone. And following in this research paradigm, Corinne moss Rakuzin and Jack DeVidio and Joe Handelsman and a number of other Yale faculty recently did a very, very similar study on women in the sciences that involved sending around resumes to scientists throughout the country. The resumes, everybody received only one resume, and at the top of it appeared either a name that would typically be read as a male name, like John, or a name that would be typically read as a female name, like Jane. And the results were as follows. Individuals who had been given the resume that had the male name viewed the candidate as significantly more competent, significantly more hireable, and significantly more worthy of intense mentoring than those who had received the resume associated with the female name. And these results also bore on the opening salary that would be given to the individual. Moreover, all student differences were significant regardless of whether the evaluator in question was himself a male or herself a female. So the effects of evaluation of the resume were being driven not merely by what you might have thought they were being driven by, the items that were listed on the resume showing a moderately qualified person for the job, but also by features of the environment of which the evaluator was presumably unaware. 
a related study in this tradition looks at what conditions are ones that promote a kind of pro-social behavior. So suppose you have a coffee system at your office that runs on an honor system, where you're supposed to put money into a little pot every time you take a cup of coffee. And suppose above that coffee maker, you put either a pair of eyes or a photograph of flowers. On the weeks where what you have are the pairs, or are simply the flowers, as you can see, donations to the coffee club are not particularly high. That's awfully close to zero. But on weeks where you have the eyes, particularly these ones, donations are very high. So in response to this, the philosophy department, which runs things on an honor system, put up the following sign. This is a quote from Kant. Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing wonder and awe, the starry sky above me and the moral law within me. My colleagues were under the impression that the reason this worked was because of this quote. But in fact, our donations went up uh, because of Mr. Kant's eyes above our coffee maker. So to conclude the first uh, insight, Socrates says in that discussion about the oracle's report that he is better off than others not because he has knowledge of the world, but because he has knowledge of his own ignorance. And it turns out that that insight is a central one to contemporary research in psychology. In many cases, we are unaware of the sources of our emotions of our choices, of our preferences, and of our pursuit of goals. Self-knowledge, that is, includes knowledge of our ignorance. But how could we be structured such that this is true of us? This turns out to be a question of central concern to Socrates' student Plato, depicted here on the left. Plato recognizes something that is a theme of all literary traditions, namely that there's a very common experience of internal strife. And he tells the story famously of Leontius, who is walking back to the city of Athens and sees along the wall of the city some dead bodies which he is intrigued by in the way that you might be intrigued by a traffic crash or by that column on the left-hand side of the CNN webpage, which has all of those, well, you know, sort of stories that seem kind of exciting and intriguing. But of course, you're not going to click on them, except you do. And that's what happened to Leontius. For a time, he struggled with himself and covered his face but finally, overpowered by appetite, he pushed his eyes wide open, as you do when you click on that story about, well, I'll leave it to your imagination. Rushed towards the corpses, saying, look for yourselves. He's speaking to his eyes, you evil wretches. Take your fill of this beautiful sight. And on the basis of stories like this one, experiences like this one, introspection about his own uh, tendency to feel this way, Plato presents in his works two different metaphors about the structure of the human soul, of which perhaps the more compelling is this idea that the human soul is composed of a charioteer, which is what Plato calls reason, and two horses, one cooperative horse, which he calls spirit, and one rather ornery horse, which he calls appetite. And he says, let us liken the human soul to the collection of this charioteer and these two horses. So the three parts of the soul, says Plato, are reason, spirit, and appetite. And conflict among the parts of the souls often leads to a kind of feeling of internal conflict. But our direct access to these parts of the soul as our discussion of Socrates has already revealed to us, is rather limited. We tend not to have direct access to our horses, 
and we sometimes even lack access to our charioteer. Now this idea that the soul has parts gets picked up again and again. We see it in the early 20th century in Freud's picture of the human soul. We see it in works like Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, which is in some ways an exploration of the ancient idea of the multi-part soul. We see applications of it in Yale University Press's book, Nudge, which is an exploration of the ways in which speaking to the horses, or in the Buddhist metaphor, the elephants, can allow us to act in the ways that we are reflectively committed to. And we see it in the work of our incoming university president, Peter Salovey, whose focus on what Plato would call the spirited part of the soul as central to human behavior and motivation underlies the project of the emotional intelligence research to which he has been so central. So this idea that the soul has parts is one that I have been exploring in my own work for about the last decade. And I have found it helpful in so doing to try to introduce some language to describe the phenomenon that Plato is describing in the story of Leontius, where one part of the soul is pulling one way and the other parts of the soul are pulling in another. So if we were to travel to the Grand Canyon, which I understand thanks to the taxpayers of the state of Arizona has now reopened, we could, if we wished, pay a visit to this horse-shaped, horseshoe-shaped walkway, which extends over the Colorado River, and which has as its floor a transparent glass surface. There's a similar building on Wacker Boulevard in Chicago, which has a glass floor. Now, if I were to take you there, and we were to stand upon that horseshoe-shaped surface, Presumably, no matter how much you were trembling, you would believe that we were totally safe. If you didn't believe that we were totally safe, it would make absolutely no sense for you to remain there even for a moment. But nonetheless, you would presumably be trembling and shaking. And that's because though you believe that you're safe, you have what I would call an A-leaf that says to you, I'm really high up, this is absolutely terrifying, I have to get off this surface. I suppose we went to see a film. I understand he had a second job later on. <laughs> and one of the characters on the screen pulls out a gun and shoots, and you duck. Presumably, it's not because you believe that film technology has become so advanced that nowadays bullets really come off the screen. Your belief is that this is just a film. But your A-leaf is that you need to watch out. So you duck. And speaking of watches, is there anybody here who does what I do, which is to indicate 10 o'clock on your watch by means of this configuration of hands? That is, to set your watch five minutes fast. Now, those of us who set our watch five minutes fast know that we have set our watch five minutes fast. When I look at my watch and it looks like this, my belief is it's 10 o'clock. That's what my watch looks like when it's 10 o'clock. But that's not what my horses think. My horses look and they think it's 10.05. I better get to where I'm going. How many of you have ever had the experience of watching a repeat projection of a sports event whose outcome you know and found yourself in the course of watching that repeat of the sports event yelling something to the individuals on the team. Presumably, when you are watching this episode, it's not that you believe that if you yell, don't run, your words will go through the screen back in time to the individual who's about to get thrown out at second base, but rather what you are a leaving, 
that causes you to yell, don't run. Suppose you are trying to increase your temporal dimensions by decreasing your spatial ones. <laughs> you might find yourself in a circumstance where, though you believe this to be undesirable, your A-leafs are pulling in another direction. And likewise, if I bring you to my Halloween party, where I am serving this, which has exactly the same ingredients as this. Those are Tootsie Rolls. We were out of pans, but I found this at the store. It's totally pristine. Is, is this not a spatula? I, 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 it, the, I, the signs had been shifted around in the grocery store. If I try to serve you this, presumably you will believe me. You came to my lecture. There were four other lectures you should have gone to, right? if you're not going to believe what I'm saying in this one. But although you believe that this is, in fact, made of the same ingredients as that, your leafs pull you in another direction. Suppose I invite you to sign this document. I hereby declare that my soul belongs only to you, O oh Satan, October 12, 2013. And because I've done my online human subjects training, I put this at the bottom. It's a legal contract. It's simply a prop in a psychology experiment. Presumably, your reluctance to sign the contract is not due to the fact that Satan's favorite font would be brush script. Or like, of course, Satan would put this on the bottom of the contract. I mean, how else would he fool you into thinking that he had gotten it past human subjects? Right? Your resistance to sign this contract has nothing to do with your beliefs. It has everything to do with your A-leafs. And if I take you to Monica Bonvicini's incredible bathroom installation, this is a public restroom that she installed on the streets of Milan, you will see when you walk into the facilities that it is totally opaque, that you are at no risk at all of being observed by the world. But here's what it looks like <laughs> on the inside. <laughs> A leaf may interfere with relief. <laughs> but this shouldn't surprise us, right? Why would we expect that beings whose information processing systems are the result of an incredible internal complexity where different parts came online, evolutionarily speaking, at different times? where there's a degree of redundancy with regard to the kinds of sources that we have for information, where there's a very limited part of us which is, it appears, directly accessible to conscious access. Why would we expect that the soul would be any different than Plato's picture and, in fact, every wisdom tradition's picture describes it to be? In some sense, this is the picture of the Leontius story. But it's important to recognize that although in the various Elif stories that I told, the smarty pants part of the brain was getting things right, and the dummy pants part of the brain was getting things wrong, there is research that suggests to the contrary that in certain sorts of situations, particularly ones with respect to which the dummy pants parts of the brains are well suited ecologically, that they will give us more accurate reports than our smarty pants front part of the brain. So if you stand people in front of a hill and ask them to estimate how steep it is, particularly in circumstances where they're tired or carrying a heavy weight, their verbal reports will tend to overestimate the steepness of the hill, whereas their haptic report, a report that involves putting your arm at the angle that you estimate the hill to be, will get the answer correct. Or if you present people with the famous Muller-Lyer illusion, your smarty prance visual system thinks that this line segment is longer than this one. But if you reach for them, your dummy pants haptic system, your hands, is much more accurate. 
So I'm going to quickly skip these two slides because I've been going slower than I meant to. Uh, and move to a discussion of the costs of strife before closing out the discussion of Plato here. So what happens when the parts of your soul are in conflict and you're trying to keep the charioteer in charge? What happens when the reflective part of your soul wants to do something and the non-reflective part of your soul keeps pulling you in a different direction. So a large body of research explores this question in the context of interracial interactions in a society structured by a legacy of black slavery. That would be this society. And the question that this body of research asks is whether the encoding of implicit racial attitudes, attitudes that I would call aliefs, affects our behavior in certain ways, even if our reflective commitments are to behave in totally non-racist ways. So for example, there's a large body of literature about whether if you're shown a cell phone or a tool in the hand of a person of African descent, you are more likely to perceive that cell phone or tool as a weapon, that is, as a gun. This is research prompted by the incident with Amadou Diallo, a young man uh, who was shot by police after having pulled a wallet from his pocket. So one body of research looks at the ways in which there's a tendency to recognize or to attribute weapon holding to an individual on the basis of their race. I already talked to you about the resume study. This is a study that just involves simple interracial interaction. And the study, which was conducted by Jennifer Richardson uh, in 2003 at Dartmouth with Dartmouth students, goes as follows. You bring students into your lab, and they interact either with a research assistant who is of European descent, or they interact with a research assistant who is of African descent. And all the students who are brought in to participate in the study are themselves students of European descent. So the interactions between the student and the research assistant are always completely pleasant. Nobody has trouble controlling their responses in the situation. But here's what Richardson does next. She has the individual engage in what's called the Stroop task. The Stroop task is one in which what you're asked to do is to name the color in which the word is printed. So you should say red, green, blue, yellow, red, green, etc. It's pretty hard. It's a good way to test whether somebody knows a language, right, if this were in Russian. Uh, we could see whether or not, though you said you weren't, you're actually a speaker of Russian. But you can use the question of the degree to which you are slowed down in performing a Stroop task as an indication of roughly how tired your charioteer is, how much work your charioteer has recently been using, and how exhausted it is by the process of having pulled on the reins. And it turns out that students who had just interacted with a research assistant of European descent were much faster at doing the Stroop task than individuals who had just interacted with a researcher of African descent. That is, their charioteer was tired. And their charioteer was tired because it had spent a bunch of time pushing down associations. And in fact, the effect described here co-varies with the degree to which the person's implicit attitudes, as measured by a test developed here at Yale by Mazur and Banaji, the implicit association task, the degree to which their implicit attitudes encode typical racial associations of our society. So conclusion from the Plato section, and then I will move quickly to Aristotle. The soul, as Plato says, is like the union of a team of winged horses and their charioteer, Responses come from different parts of the soul, or as the picture of the brain showed, of the brain. Sometimes they're in harmony, sometimes they're in tension, and when they are in tension, it can be costly. It employs a certain amount of energy 
to keep the horses from doing what you don't want them to do. So what strategies could there be for keeping your horses in line that don't involve direct involvement of the charioteer? This is the question whose answer we'll turn to Aristotle for. So Aristotle writes, and this is my favorite quotation, so much so that I've got it four times in the next section of the talk. So if you want to zone out, miss this slide, and I'll give it to you three times again. Aristotle writes, people become builders by building and harp players by playing the harp. So too, he says, do we become just by doing just acts, temperate by doing temperate acts, brave by doing brave acts. States of character, says Aristotle, arise out of like activities. It therefore makes no small difference whether we form habits of one kind or another from our very youth. Rather, it makes all the difference. So here's a t-shirt which they wear at MIT, which students at MIT think is funny, and students at Yale think it's funny that students at MIT think it's funny. <laughs> so why is that shirt either first or second order funny? The shirt's either first or second order funny because it plays off a distinction in the notion of law, which turns out to underlie Aristotle's insight. So we can distinguish, as philosophers and others do, between laws that express oughts, ways things should be, sometimes called normative laws, laws like look both ways before you cross the street, or don't eat food in the library, or speed limit, 65 miles an hour. So we can have normative laws on the one hand, and descriptive laws on the other. Descriptive laws are things that tell you how things are, like if a car hits you, you will die, or crumbs cause book decay, or speed limit, 186,000 miles per second, another MIT t-shirt. So the difference between these kinds of laws is that the first kind of law, normative laws, express things that you ought to do or should do. You should look both ways. You should not eat food in the library. You should go fewer than 65 miles an hour, whereas descriptive laws express facts. Aristotle's insight is that patterns of behavior that are initially under conscious control, that are initially the result of a commitment to shoulds, become automatized as a result of our having done them. Habits are tools for turning normative commitments, views about the way things ought to be inside you, into descriptive truths, ways that you, as a matter of fact, behave. One of the things Yale is trying to reinstill in all of us is this habit. Before I cross the street, I habitually look both ways. And we can see the extent to which we've encoded this. If you grew up in England and come to America, or if you live in America and go to England, it's incredibly hard to cross the street. And it's incredibly hard to cross the street because, in fact, you've automatized your street crossing routine. And when I get to England, I find myself looking 100 times back and forth because it isn't evident to me, even though I know reflectively they drive on the left, what it is that I should be doing. If you hand me an item, I habitually, without reflection, say thank you. This is what parenting is about. It's about instilling these sorts of habits in kids. But of course, there's no rule that says the only things that can be encoded through habit are things that we reflectively endorse. Habits are also tools for turning counter-normative commitments ought nots into descriptive ones. When I turn my, on my computer, I habitually choose your sin. Mine's number four. <laughs> but they're nice, aren't they? All right. So this idea that you see in Aristotle's uh, ethics is picked up in this recent bestseller by Yale graduate Charles Duhigg. And it is, I think, the central idea in one, uh, the work of one of our other lectors this weekend, Alan Kasdan, who gave, or perhaps right now is giving, his lecture on bullying. 
So when Aristotle is speaking about moral education in the context of the ethics, he says this, if arguments were sufficient by themselves to make people decent, that is, if simply talking to the charioteer were enough to make the horses behave, then arguments would rightly command uh, much praise. But it's impossible, says Aristotle, to alter by argument what has long been absorbed as the result of habits. How do we make changes? We become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate ones, brave by doing brave actions. And this is exactly what you find in the literature of cognitive behavioral therapy and the applications of that literature in scientifically informed books about parenting. What you find in them is an articulation of this Aristotelian insight. Instead of thinking about what you don't want somebody to do, instead of talking to their charioteer, start training their horses. Think in terms of the behavior that you do want to promote, and then provide opportunities for reinforced practice of the desired behavior. The best way to build up a behavior is that way. And I think that we've heard that before. Because we learn a craft by producing the same product we must produce when we build it. We become builders by building, harpists by playing the harp, uh, just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate actions. That is the insight that underlies scientifically informed parenting guides or self-help books like the Dewey Habit book is this fundamental Aristotelian insight that habits are tools for turning normative commitments into descriptive truths. Moreover, there is a kind of circularity to this reinforced practice. The more you engage in a behavior, the more natural it becomes. The more natural it becomes, the easier it is to engage in it without effort. So in conclusion, habits are tools for turning oughts into ises. We learn a craft by producing what we must produce when we've learned it. Harpists by playing the harp, builders by building just by just, I told you I would give it two four times. Temperate by doing temperate ones. In shorthand, if you want to become something, act as if that's what you already were. And if you do that often enough, it will be what you become. But habits are hard to change. Habits are particularly hard to change in isolation. And habits are particularly hard to change without a community of support to enable that. And in the final two episodes of the talk, and I'll wrap up in less than 10 minutes, I promise, I want to talk a little bit about the role of social interaction in the context of friendship, and then a little bit about the classification of activities into ones over which we do and don't have direct control. So let's turn now to the work of Cicero. Again, the articulation of this view that I'm giving you comes from the work of Cicero. But the ideas that are here are actually central to Aristotle's own discussions of friendship. Cicero writes, how can it be worth living without the mutual goodwill of a friend? Is not prosperity robbed of its value if you have no one to share your joy? Friendship, says Cicero, improves happiness, abates misery. It doubles our joy and divides our grief. Somehow, in the face of another, it becomes possible to gain a kind of perspective on one's own actions. In the face of a true friend, writes Cicero, we gain, as it were, a second self. So this idea that the support of community is crucial to our well-being is something that is given central place in the work of a uh, distinguished Yale alumnus, Jonathan Haidt. He writes in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, if you want to predict, and, and this claim is based on a reading of the research, if you want to predict how happy someone is or how long they'll live, you should find out about their social relationships. Having strong social relationships strengthens the immune system. It extends life even more than quitting smoking, though may I add, you should do that too. <laughs> 
It speeds recovery from surgery. It reduces the risk of depression and anxiety disorders. That is, being embedded within a community of others with whom one has healthy reciprocal relations of affirmation and support turns out to be, unsurprisingly for evolved social beings like ourselves, as you might have learned at Lori Santos's talk yesterday, turns out to be central to our thriving. But it also turns out to be a way that we can experience moments that are challenging as less challenging. So I told you earlier that studies seem to have shown that if you estimate how high a hill is when, you, for example, you're carrying a backpack or you're really tired, you'll verbally report a hill that's like 10 degrees as being, oh, I don't know, it must be 25, 30, 40 degrees. Unless, unless, you're standing next to a friend. And if you're standing next to a friend, the effect of the backpack in causing you to estimate the hill as being so steep gets mitigated. And you're more likely to see yourself as easily able to perform the activity. Participants accompanied by a friend estimated the hill to be less steep than those who were alone if they thought of a friend, you don't even need to be with them. You just need to remember them. Perceive or at least report perception of the hill as less steep. This idea that friendship and support of community is valuable is a central idea in the Buddhist notion of right association, which explores the question of what preconditions need to be in place to allow you to make the sorts of changes to which you are reflectively committed. So before setting out on the path to enlightenment, the Buddhist tradition encourages you to surround yourself by others who share the ideals towards which you hope to bring your own horses or in the case of the Buddhist version of the metaphor, your own elephants. And the tradition writes of the following. When a wild elephant is to be tamed, that is, when you have a way of behaving that you reflectively disavow, that you want to begin to change, here's what you can do. You can yoke yourself to one who has already begun the process of change. By connecting yourself directly in interactions in a way that makes it evident to you that somebody else is already behaving in the way that you wish to, by contact, it becomes apparent not just to your reason, but also to the non-rational parts of your soul that the condition towards which you're striving is not wholly incompatible with being an elephant. That what is expected of you heralds a condition that does not totally contradict your nature. And continues the teaching, the constant, immediate, and contagious example of a yoke fellow can teach as nothing else can. And to play out the metaphor, as with the elephant, so with the life of the spirit. Now, we already saw the ways in which feeling oneself to be observed by another can change behavior. There's a large body of research that shows that simply putting a mirror in a room so that you feel observed, taping a pair of eyes onto your computer so that you feel looked at, can cause you to engage in behavior that you are reflectively committed to behaving in, but that your horses were somehow reluctant with regard to. That is, that friendship not only is a way of magnifying joy and reducing grief, that is, that positive social contact magnifies emotional pleasure and tempers emotional pain, but that in the face of a true friend, one can see a second self 
in the presence of others, we can develop new patterns of perception and response. But of course, the question of where we should devote our energies in undertaking these processes of change is a crucial one. And regarding that, I will turn in the final section to the very first explicit self-help book ever written. One might think of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics as a self-help book, but Epictetus's handbook was literally meant as a self-help book. And it was a book that was read by virtually every person educated in the Western tradition for many, many centuries. This one happens to be John Adams' personal copy. You can see his name in the upper right-hand corner. And Epictetus writes in the famous opening pages of his book, 2,000 years ago, some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. Our opinions are up to us and our impulses, our desires, our aversions, in short, whatever is our own doing. But our bodies are not up to us, nor our possessions, nor our public reputations. And if you make the mistake of miscategorizing, says Epictetus, you are doomed. If you suppose that things that are not up to you are up to you, you will face constant frustration because you will be trying to control what you cannot. And as a result, you will lament. You will be disturbed and you will find fault with both gods and men. But if you restrict your efforts to an appropriate domain, you will be fine. If you think that, is, that only what is yours is yours, and that what is not your own is not your own, then in some ways you are immune to the world's vicissitudes. No one can ever coerce you, no one can hinder you, no one, you will blame no one, you will accuse no one, you will do not a single thing unwillingly. Now, some of you may find yourself reminded of something by this thought. Some things are up to us, some things are not up to us. When I ask my students whether it reminds them of something, uh, about 22% can identify what it reminds them of, and a bunch of them think that maybe they've heard it before and uh, about a quarter of the class wonders why I was asking that question. What it reminds you of, presumably, uh, is the Lord's Prayer, uh, composed apparently here at Yale in 1912 by Reinhold Niebuhr. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, which you can find decorated with morning glories or a puppy. That's from the dog parade this morning. Uh, or this sweet angel or a little praying girl, or you can put it on your ashtray. Uh, because you read the John Hyatt and you think all I need are some friends, uh, or you can get it tattooed on your arm or your elbow or the side of your chest. Um, the ideas that underlie the fundamental Epictetan insight are central to the programs to which it's been given rise, in particular to 12-step programs and their cousins because it turns out that it's true that some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. And that although we cannot directly control many things in the world, we can directly, or amendment due to our first four lessons, indirectly but indirectly in predictable ways, control many things in ourselves. But in order to determine which ones we are capable of controlling and which ones we are not, we require a certain kind of self-knowledge. So that's the full circle that I want to come. And I want to close with a little epilogue about an individual who found these lessons to be exceptionally valuable in an exceptionally trying situation. So this is, anybody recognize him? James Stockdale. James Stockdale, who was, as you know, the vice presidential candidate associated with Ross Perot 
1980, but perhaps more relevantly, a companion of John McCain's in a prison in Vietnam during the Vietnam War for about five years. And Stockdale, after he was released from prison, wrote a book called Testing Epictetus in the Cauldron of War. And it was an exploration of the ways in which, for himself, this Epictetan distinction between things that are within your control and things that are not was something that allowed him to survive the circumstances in which he finds himself. And so he writes, on September 9th, 1965, I flew at 500 knots right into a flak trap at treetop level in a little A4 airplane, which I couldn't steer after it was on fire. Its control system shot out. After ejection, he continues, I had about 30 seconds to make my last statement in freedom before I landed in the main street of the little village ahead. As, and so help me, I whispered to myself, five years down there at least, I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. And the book goes on to describe the ways in which during that half decade of imprisonment, the capacity to distinguish between things which were in his control, that is, his responses to the situations that confronted him, and things that were not in his control, that is, the tortures which were being inflicted upon him, was what allowed him to maintain a feeling of dignity. In my thoughts, he says, as I ejected from that airplane, was the understanding that I would commit to keeping separate files for those things that are up to me and those that are not. Everything in category B are external, beyond my control, dooming me to fear and anxiety if I covet them. By contrast, all in category A are properly subjects for my concern and involvement. They include my opinions, my aims, my aversions, my grief, my joy, my judgments, my attitudes about what is going on. But of course, as Stockdale himself recognized, changing one's attitudes to allow this division into the categories of things that are in your control and things that are not, requires a recognition that we can't merely look to our reflective self to the answers for the answers to those questions. That because our soul has these parts, that learning to try not to control the things in category A is not merely a matter of rational commitment to so doing, but also a matter of the cultivation of habits. That so doing requires being surrounded by a community of others to whom one can turn for support. And that once those pieces are in place, it's possible truly to recognize and to act on the insight that some things are up to us and some things indeed are not. So thanks, and I'm happy to take questions.